Happy International Women's Day. My name is Rochelle <laughs> Ruthchild, and I'm happy to be the moderator for this panel sponsored by the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies um, and the Gender, Women, and Post Socialism and Post Socialism Workshop at the Center. A word about International Women's Day it was proclaimed on August 26, 1910 by the International Socialist Women's Congress and has been celebrated. Uh, it was celebrated originally on different dates, but now for many, many years now, it's been celebrated on March 8th. So the talk today is Ukrainian women from the Holocaust to the Russian invasion. And I'm honored to have as our speaker today, uh, Dr. Marta Havrishko. Dr. Harishko is a doc Dr. Thomas Zand, visiting assistant professor in Holocaust pedagogy and anti-Semitism studies at the Strassler Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Clark University in Worcester. She holds a PhD in history from the Ivan Franco National University of Lviv. She is also a director of the Institute at the Babinyar Holocaust Memorial Center in Kiev. Havrishko is a member of the editorial board of the academic journal Eastern Europe Holocaust Studies. She's the author of the book Overcoming Silence, Women's War Stories, published in Kharkiv in 2019, and numerous articles about women's experiences of World War II and the Holocaust. Dr. Havrishko was a, has been a recipient of a number of fellowships and grants, her research has been supported by the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, the Vienna Wiesenthal Institute for Holocaust Studies, Yahad Im Unum, Monash University, and various other institutions. Currently, she is developing a book on sexual violence during the Holocaust in Ukraine. Dr. Harishko evacuated from Ukraine with her nine-year-old son at the beginning of the Russian full-scale invasion in 2022. And she tries to raise awareness about Russian war crimes in Ukraine. Dr. Havrishko. Yeah, thank you so much, Rochelle, for your very kind introduction. Hello, everyone. I am very happy to be and honored to be here today and to speak about women's rights, basically, violation of women's rights, support for women whose rights were violated. It's so important for me as a woman from uh, Ukraine. Um, as you know, we in Ukraine for a long time, it was um, uh, post-Soviet tradition to celebrate International Women's Day as a um, holiday when women um, you know, celebrated for their traditional roles and the mothers, uh, sisters, daughters, and politicians in their speeches, they underline their, you know, inspiration of those women, their beauty, and so on. Today, we have very different discourse about women in Ukraine, in their roles uh, in political, economic life, cultural life, academic life, but also their roles in current war against Ru Russia's war against Ukraine. So the discourse changed dramatically and feminist organizations in Ukraine put a lot of efforts in order to change this discourse, this uh, very sexist discourse, political that was very vital in Ukraine in the past, uh, in the past years. So let me share my screen. Today, I will talk on a very uh, disturbing topic about uh, sexual violence during the Holocaust and during the Russian aggression against Ukraine. Some of you could think that this is inappropriate comparison, maybe even immoral, but as a researcher of both war, for me, what were, uh, was very important to understand how our understanding of sexual violence in war and genocide changed in the past eight years. How we developed survivor-centered approach, how we respond to sexual violence in war. Could we prevent today this violence and could we support survivors 
uh, appropriately survivors, their family members, and um, and community members who suffered from sexual violence as well. So the Russian full-ski invasion of Ukraine that started in February 2022 was a starting point for the biggest sexual victimization of Ukraine women and girls since the Second World War. And many patterns of violence are very similar to those who we witness in the World War II and in the Holocaust. And consequences of this violence effects are also very similar, but the responses today are very different. And we will talk today about some of those aspects. So first of all, we should keep in mind the sexual violence started with dehumanization, started with the hate, hate speech, and the hate in public discourse, political discourse. Two main causes of sexual violence in every single conflict, in every single war and genocide, caused by two kinds of hate. First, the hate against women, misogyny. And the second is hate against the special group community to which those women belong. For example, ethnic community, national, religious, and so on. When we take a closer look at Nazi anti-Semitic propaganda, dehumanization was everywhere. Jewish people were portrayed as not human, as subhuman. Many of them were portrayed as those who support communism and Soviet repressions and Soviet regime. Especially it was very vivid in Ukraine when Jewish people were blamed for every single crime committed by Soviet power in Ukraine. For Holodomor, for example, the Great Famine organized in 1932-33 that took lives of more than 4 million people. For Soviet repressions, for repressions against Ukraine, church, Ukraine intelligentsia, and against Ukraine nationalist identity. Jewish women played uh, some role in Nazi propaganda as well. And as you see from this children's book, very popular in Nazi Germany, Jewish women were portrayed as not attractive, as very ugly women with specific features that were attributed to Jews. But also they were portrayed as those who exploit so-called Aryan women, Aryan girls. And they were portrayed, of course, as the supporters of their husbands who are collaborating with Soviet regime and they are key agents of Soviet regime. This very specific concept of Judeo-Bolshevism is very present in many cases of sexual violence during the Holocaust in Ukraine. For example, in Jewish agricultural colony Neleben near Krivoyrych, four rape survivors, Celia, Anna, Yevgenia, and Klavdia, told Jewish authorities during interrogation that those members of gang who were entering Jewish homes, who beat Jewish people, who raped Jewish women, often expressed anti-Soviet views, where they made the, the clear connection between Jews and, their, and uh, the Soviet rule. And as investigation shows, many of the members of this gang were um, were descendants of people repressed by Soviet regime in back in 1920s, 1930s. So basically, we see this ideologically charged language during the acts of sexual violence. The similar pattern of dehumanization we observe, unfortunately, in political media discourse in current Russia. Recently, in Ryazan, a propaganda train of the Ministry of Defense, Russian Ministry of Defense, delivered those booklets to school children that compared Russia to Ukraine and compared Russian soldiers to Ukraine soldiers. And as you see, Ukraine flag is marked as so-called Nazi flag, 
Ukraine soldiers are portrayed as brutal killers, those who behead children, those who are raping people, those who are homosexual in comparison to, to decent Russian soldiers and Russian men who preserve so-called traditional values and traditional families, who are loving father, fathers and loving husbands. In political discourse, Ukraine was portrayed as so-called Nazi state. We know that many propagandists and politicians in Russia, including Putin, uh, used and misused the history of the Holocaust and the Second World War in order to justify its brutal aggression against Ukraine. He claimed that Ukrainians are Nazi and Nazi collaborators, that so-called Kyiv regime is Nazi and should be destroyed. The same ideas we observe in this propagandist article titled What Should Russia Do With Ukraine? authored by Timofey Sergeyev. What and it was basically a genocidal plan that uh, was published in RIA Novosti, the main mainstream state control media. So basically, this genocidal language was present at the beginning of this Pulsky invasion and is still present in Russian political discourse. And I believe it hu hu hugely contribute to the sexual victimization of Ukraine women, girls, men and boys. We know that Putin promotes this hegemonic masculinity, very toxic masculinity, where misogyny and sexism played a huge role. Right before the Fulski invasion, he made this rape joke, whether you like it or don't like it, bear with it my beauty, where Ukraine was portrayed as a submissive wife, basically, and Russia was portrayed as a husband. And um, any disobedience of a wife should be punished in this framework. When soldiers hear this type of language, I believe they, they think that sexual violence, basically subjugation of Ukraine through the using of sexual violence is acceptable. Um, and uh, from testimonies of those survivors of sexual violence in different regions in Ukraine, we hear that some of them were called Nazi slots and some of them were called so-called Banderovka. It's a reference to Stepan Bandera, a leader, controversial leader in Ukraine history, leader of Ukraine um, uh, organization of Ukraine nationalists that collaborated with Nazis, also participated in the, uh, the Holocaust and ethnic cleansing of, of Poles and killing civilians, but today they are celebrated as freedom fighters in Ukraine because they fought um, with Soviet state and their main aim was the establishment of Ukraine independent state. And this kind of language actually is then evidence that many soldiers actually, um, they absorb these uh, these. Uh, Russian state propaganda about Nazis in Ukraine. And this woman, for example, was called Banderovka, but she lives in her son region. And her son region in general has nothing to do with Bandera and Bandera movement in general. But, you know, those women who are expressed Ukrainian views, who are expressed disobedience and disloyalty to Russian state and Russian occupation authorities could be called easily Nazi. They are branded as Nazi and the sexual violence in this regard sometimes is used as a uh, means of punishment of those so-called Nazis. So who are targeted? From different, from different conflicts and wars, we know that no, not all groups of we women are targeted uh, at the same level. Some are more vulnerable and some less. For example, during the Holocaust, Jewish women and girls were particularly vulnerable to sexual violence because of Nazi racism, anti-Semitism, and the sexism. Of course, today, due to extensive research made by Regina Milhoiser and other researchers, we know that 
uh, German soldiers uh, also raid Ukraine, women, Slavic women in Ukraine territory. But those who were most vulnerable to sexual violence, of course, at least until 1933, were Jewish women and girls. And many testimonies of survivors of this violence, they reveal information that that contradicts this very widespread myth that only beautiful and young women and girls were targeted. For example, Clara survived Gerun ghetto in Zhitomar Oblast, and she remembered that both little girls, for example, eight years old, and elderly women suffered from sexual violence from local policemen and German soldiers. But who else suffered in Jewish community? Today we are calling, uh, we, we have some distinguished between so-called primary victims of sexual violence and so-called secondary victims. And by secondary victims, we, we mean uh, sometimes uh, family members who were forced to observe and family members who were aware of these sexual violence and they suffer big trauma um, in relation to this. But what about men? Today's study, gender study, con studies connected to Holocaust reveal that many men suffer sexual violence during the Holocaust. For example, homosexual men, they were castrated, they were raped, they were subjugated um, to different kinds of humiliation. For example, some of them survived the, the so-called mandatory visit to camp brad brothels, which were used by Nazis as a cure of their so-called cure of their homosexuality. But what about Jewish men in the Soviet Ukraine, in the territory of entire Ukraine? We have only few testimonies about this, and one of these testimonies really um, related to the experience of Isaac from Bar Vinneska Oblast in the center of Ukraine. He told to Soviet interrogators in 1960s about his humiliation when he, together with two other Jewish girls were taken from the ghetto and were accompanied by this man, Gregory Andrusin, who was the chief of local police there, to the building where assessment were waiting for them. And your interrogation here with the information that he, together with those girls, were street naked. But what happened then, then to, to, to him? We don't know, because Soviet investigators were not willing to develop the story. They were not interested in hearing these stories, and they definitely didn't uh, perceive this kind of humiliation as a sexual violence. That's why we still have only few uh, testimonies about victimization of Jewish men and boys. What we know about Ukraine nowadays? We know that almost every single person in the occupied Russian territories could be targeted by sexual violence. The oldest woman survivor is 83 year old. The youngest known girl survivor is four year old. We also know about pregnant women, for example, 16 year old girl who was pregnant five months when she was raped by the a uh, soldier affiliated with Russian army from so-called DNR Republic. But also in this war, we have a lot of testimonies about sexual violence against men and boys. First of all, against, bo against men. We have some forensic clear evidence. For example, in the uh, deoccupied Izum Kharkiv Oblast, among those bodies exhumed, several male bodies have their genitals cut off. It is, uh, uh, um, so basically they were tortured and because their hands were tied uh, behind their back and they are, uh, they uh, they uh, survive this type of sexual violence. But the most vulnerable to sexual violence are men in detention, both civilian and military men. UN, in its report, um, reveal information about this and uh, about genital mutilation, about forced nudity, about threat of rape, rape actually, and other different types of sexual ones that 
Ukraine men underwent in uh, Russian captivity in different detention centers, in checkpoints, in filtration camps, in torture chambers. And today we know that thousands basically of Ukraine men are in Russian captivity and from different wars. For example, even war on terror from Abu Ghraib, we know that many men are subjected to sexual violence because uh, they are very, very vulnerable in detention. What we know about patterns of violence in terms of uh, uh, in terms of um, Ju uh, women's experience, Jewish women's experience during the Holocaust. We know that many types of violence were very brutal and um, many women were shot dead, were killed right after uh, after being raped. One of the reasons for that is, uh, is attempt to conceal the rape and to get away with the punishment. Because as we know, due to racial laws, it was forbidden to have sex both consensual and uh, um, non-consensual with Jewish women. And Ukraine policemen, for example, members of Ukraine police during the, the Nazi occupation, they were not allowed to rape Jewish women. But of course, those raped happened very often due to different reasons that we will discuss later. Many women and girls, they received such a um, great harm that some of them lost their lives in uh, in following days after the raid. It was the case in Olizarka, a Jewish agricultural, uh, agricultural colony, when locals organized a pogrom against Jewish people uh, right after the um, uh, Soviet, uh, Soviet uh, uh, Red Army retreat and uh, um, Nazi Nazi occupiers didn't come yet. So basically, they attack Jewish homes, they rob them, they humiliate them publicly, and they raped Jewish girls in front of their fathers very often. This testimony of Beryl Berko uh, revealed this this kind of humiliation. He himself witnessed the rape of his own uh, daughter. We know that many women after this um, um, after this humiliation could take their life or their family members could, couldn't bear this and took their lives. Uh, for example, Rosa Moskowitz remember her good friend who uh, was an active communist before the occupation, before 1941. And during the Lviv pogrom uh, in July 1941, she was publicly humiliated by the mob and then she took her life. What we observe in today's Ukraine, that some Russian soldiers behave uh, in a very brutal way. They not only rape women, but they also brutally kill them after that, like um, the survivor of this, like victim. Um, one of the example is example of victim, a 40 year old victim in Kyiv region who was gun raped and then, and then killed. Other women as well were uh, not only um, sexually humiliated, but they survived different types of physical abuse during their captivity. And from these testimonies given to given by Ukraine local men who witnessed the bodies of those women and who were even forced to take those bodies to the to put them uh, in the car and set this car uh, on fire in order to to conceal this crime, they remembered how those bodies looked like, and it was bruises and blood on them, and they were completely naked, and uh, many of them, uh, basically all of them, due to those testimonies, had the same marks of, uh, of abuse and beating. When uh, the first accounts of sexual violence started to appear in public sphere in um, March 2022, I was I was shocked basically by the pattern of violence, uh, but by one of the pattern of violence which was very common in, uh, during the Holocaust, especially in the first wave of of rapes during the pogroms in 1941 or when German soldiers invaded uh, invaded um, homes of Jewish people and raped Jewish girls in front of the parents, like it was for example in Ternopil. 
uh, in Galicia. Public violence, public sexual violence, actually, was the part of this wide range of violence, anti-Jewish violence in pogroms in many localities in Lviv, for example. You all know those very vivid, iconic, I, I would say, uh, pictures of anti-Jewish violence, this pogrom, where women were stripped naked by local perpetrators. They were beaten on their genitals and some of them raped. And the cases of rape we have not only in Lviv, but in different regions. We know as well that many survivors were raped in front of their family members. That, um, that was very traumatic to both uh, survivors and their family members. And Sheldon, for example, who was born in Sasu, Galicia, and he was only 12 years old. Remember how four German soldiers raped his uh, older sister, Esther, in front of all of them. And then he remember how he, uh, how the father basically prepared the shelter for, for those women, for, 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 for daughters, and was trying to keep them safe. We know other testimonies from other ghettos and camps, how girls and women were raped in front of, of their family members, like Svetlana, remember it. When the Germans saw the girl, they ignored the fact that her mother and father were standing nearby. She was raped by four Germans. In agricultural colony in May 11 that I mentioned at the beginning of our presentation, Many of those women were also raped in front of their family members. For example, Celia, she was the wife of Red Army soldiers at that time, Jewish Red Army soldier, and she had a newborn baby. And when this gang of perpetrators among them, you see one of them is portrayed in this, in this uh, document from the criminal case, a uh, Soviet criminal case. So basically, they uh, they. Um, threatened them to to kill uh, to kill them or to kill babies, and they uh, and they raped them in, in those buildings where a couple of families were gathered. The similar patterns of public rape, of the rape when it's a kind of performance sometimes uh, we observe in Russia's war against Ukraine. For example, in Mariupol, a woman was gun raped by uh, in front of her six-year-old son, and she died uh, after that, and son had the difficulties with speaking, and he turned gray. One of the survivors from Kyiv region was raped um, in her house, basically, and at the same time, her husband was trying to protect her. Like, we, we have numerous cases when husbands are trying to intervene and they uh, basically are killed by Russian forces. Also, in this building, for example, a young family in their 30s lived with the small child, and the husband was also killed, and the woman was humiliated several times by Russian soldiers, and then they burned this house, um, and uh, uh, this woman gave her testimony to a local national guard. Many uh, examples of sexual violence are from Kyiv region, uh, especially from Bucha. We know that Bucha is one of the most deadliest place in Ukraine in this war. More than 500 uh, civilian, uh, civilians were killed during the short term of Russian occupation. As I told you, many instances of sexual violence are perpetrated in captivity. It was the case as well during the Holocaust. For example, Mikhail Sokovenko, who was a Ukraine man, and he was arrested under the suspicion of his communist activity, remembered that he was in cell with a Jewish girl of 14 years old, and she was often taken from the cell, and after she returned, she would tell me, he said, that policemen raped her. And one of these policemen actually was the chief of this local prison in Ganiches, her son Oblast, Alexander Nastashenko. Many 
a testimony is about rape uh, survived from Bogdanovka camp in Mykolaiv Oblast. It was the concentration camp where approximately 50,000 Jews were killed by Romanians and their local collaborators, many of them ethnic Germans. And um, uh, even uh, ex-policemen, they testified about sexual humiliation by other policemen and including Volksdeutschers um, in these ethnic Germans in this locality who helped Romanian forces, occupying forces, to kill Jews, to humiliate them, and to persecute them. So basically, they gave their testimonies to Soviet authorities in order maybe to escape some harsh punishment, to, to make a deal with the Soviet authority, but they revealed this information. And also, we have information from the survivors themselves. And from different criminal cases that survived in former KGB archives, we uh, we see those testimonies of Holocaust survivors about the brutal behavior of local policemen who were trying uh, to to rape Jewish uh, girls and women and rob them, like like uh, in uh, Shum's ghetto. But also in labor camps, a survivor of Ber uh, uh, labor camp, um, Lisa Horanir Berdychev, Volodymyr Pekelis, remembered that women were separated from men. And during night, the drunk policemen, together with Germans, they broke into their building where women were located. They raped them. And women, after that, they uh, discussed this with, uh, with men. And they suffered uh, a great... Um, uh, the great loss and great trauma because some of them discussed that they want to die rather than being violated um, uh, all the time uh, uh, so frequently. Many women uh, also were took by Russian soldiers uh, by, for, for different pretexts. For example, some of them were accused of helping Ukraine military, of giving Ukraine military some information about the location of Russian forces. They were blamed to to actually uh, for, for some um, suspicion activity. And while in captivity, they were brutalized and they were raped by Russian soldiers. Sometimes those who were organizers were uh, were commanders themselves, like, like in case of 50-year-old Alla from Izum. She remembered, I started crying and screaming, but he took my clothes off and asked his soldiers who would be the first to rape me. She was in captivity 10 days together with her husband. Not only Ukraine's civilian women and girls are suffered, suffering sexual violence in the hands of Russian soldiers and Russian affiliated forces, but also Ukraine military women, Ukraine soldiers who are prisoners of wars. For example, in this photo, you see female uh, soldiers released from Russian captivity in April, at the beginning of April 2022. And as you see, their heads are shaved. They experience this as an attack on their femininity. They experience this as a sexualized violence due to the meaning of hair to to uh, uh, to identity to the womanhood, and uh, then they reveal information that they were street naked and forced to make so called exercises in front of Russian male guards. Um, who were the perpetrators? When we look at the Holocaust, the main question is who basically were the perpetrators? Whom uh, to fear? Um, and uh, it's a uh, um, very important question nowadays when we look at perpetrators in different wars. In Russia's aggression against Ukraine, it's almost clear who are the perpetrators. Mostly they are Russian soldiers and uh, soldiers from so-called DNR and LNR. And today, Ukraine uh, Ukraine prosecutors, Ukraine, Ukraine justice actors, they identified dozens of those men who took part in sexual victimization of Ukraine women. Despite of some uh, of some evidence that some of Ukraine military men uh, perpetrated sexual violence as well, and for example, members of the territorial defense, but uh, so far we have. Uh, only few evidence, and it's um, we we can't put them in uh, uh, in the same level as Russian forces. 
uh, as we know, some some politicians are trying to speculate on this and claim that all parties are involved in sexual violence, all parties commit sexual crimes, and all are equal. It's not true, basically. And uh, Ukraine polls um, uh, uh, reveal this information. They clearly show that Ukraine women and Ukraine people do not afraid Ukrainian soldiers. In these results of the survey conducted by Kokucher of Dem Democratic uh, Initiatives Foundation and the Razumkov Center, you see that approximately 10, 20 percent of Ukraine people they trust to Ukraine armed forces. And um, in comparison to President of Ukraine, for example, only 41% nowadays. It was conducted uh, in, in December 2023, this research. So basically today, uh, Ukraine armed forces, they enjoy this credibility. They enjoy support, uh, a huge amount of support of both men and women in Ukraine. But what about uh, Jewish women and girls during the Holocaust? What about Jewish uh, Jewish people during the Holocaust? The problem is that not only Germans were to fear, not only German soldiers or Hungarian soldiers or Romanian soldiers who were present on the territory of Ukraine and their collaborators and their allied forces were perpetrators, but also locals. Those local, local men who were members of auxiliary police, for example, or members of administrative units, administrative forces who were mayors of the city, for example, who were in charge, who were empowered by occupying forces. And in some cases, that could be fellow villager, like in case of Arsenyi Panasiuk. He raped 18-year-old Hanka in his city in, in the, um, close to their, uh, to their common village, Rafalivka in in Volin, in uh and then he killed her then it could be friends family friends for example in the case of charlotte it was uh it it happened when she was told by her father you can you can go to our house that now is occupied by my good friend and you can ask him for support but when she did it she was sexually violated by him and she was threatened by him. And uh, for a long time, she kept silence about what happened to her because she was afraid to reveal this information. Sometimes um, those perpetrators of se sexual violence during the Holocaust were just local people, local peasants, for example. From the testimony of Sarah Shapiro, she pretended to be, we know that she pretended to be a, a, a Christian girl and she was a maid in Ukraine family um, in uh, Volin. And uh, she remembered that once a young Jewish girl, very attractive, very nice and very beautiful, she was trying to to ask her help of those local Ukrainian peasants. But instead, they took her gold, they raped her, and they took, uh, and um, they uh, even made the jokes about that. Women were not safe anywhere, Jewish women, I mean, during the Holocaust. They were not safe at their homes. They were not safe in the streets. They were not safe in hiding places, for example, in forests. And forests in Ukraine were full of different partisans. Some of them belonged to the Soviet partisan unit, some of them to Ukrainian nationalist unit, some of them to Polish unit. Uh, and some of them were just semi-criminal bands and who hunted Jews. And Gidel, for example, she was hiding with her husband, uh, Abram, in Ternopil region. And she was violated, uh, she believed, by a member of Ukraine Nationals Underground Bandera movement. She was violated in front of her husband, Abram. But also those who were uh, aid providers, those who took care about Jewish groups, Jewish people, sometimes turned into violators, into violent perpetrators. They demanded sometimes sexual favors from Jewish women and girls, and sometimes they 
simply they simply rape them and here you see one of these example told by Lola Margulis they were hiding a group of Jewish people um, including her were hiding near Scarlet in Ternopil Oblast and uh, um, among them were two beautiful young women Wasserman's daughter and uh, the oldest one agreed to to basically to use her body as a survival tool for her and for entire group of Jewish people who were in hiding with her. What about visibility? It's a huge contrast between the Holocaust and today's uh, sexual violence in today's Russia war against Ukraine. For a long time, uh, it was believed that Germans couldn't perpetrate rape against Jewish women and girls because the Nuremberg laws, due to this concept of Ras and Shander, they were not allowed to do this. So basically, this myth prevent many people from discussing this topic, from acknowledging the gender trauma of Jewish women and girls. In Soviet Union, it was another political reason for that, and it was the state anti-Semitism in 1850s, 60s, uh, 70s, and so, uh, so on, so forth. So basically, during the spirit of state anti-Semitism, it was complete silence about the Holocaust, and it was, uh, as you remember, this concept of peaceful Soviet citizens as um, victims in the Great Patriotic War, without the distinguishing between different groups of, of um, victims and without underlying specific uh, specific harm and specific trauma of Jewish community. Many other factors contributed to the silence about, about um, sexual victimization of Jewish women and girls, girls in Soviet Union. One of them was the policy after the war when women who uh, were in occupied territories uh, during the war, after the war, were questioned um, were questioned about their behavior and their behavior actually was considered sometimes as socially dangerous due to their intimate uh, relations or uh, different kinds of fraternization with German soldiers and their local helpers. So basically what we know from uh, what is uh, very visible from those uh, interrogation protocols of those women, they were trying to underline that they were forced to do some sexual favors to provide sexual favors to local perpetrators or to German occupiers. It wasn't sex. It was uh, basically rape. It was violence they were trying to claim in order to avoid this persecution for so-called sexual collaboration by uh, Soviet authorities. But also we know that Soviet authorities were trying to use the cases of sexual violence in political, in their political goals. And sometimes they were not very, um, uh, so say, sensitive. They revealed the uh, um, identity of women who were raped. They revealed their name. They revealed uh, details of their uh, humiliation. And it could harm their social life in their communities. And um, the, the clear example of this is one of the propagandist um, article about a local policeman, Dmitro Zhuk in Vradivka. And he, with his uh, counterparts, he violated two sisters, Zhenya and Lilia. And I believe that after public publications like that, many women will think twice before approaching NKVD and telling them what they uh, what they experienced during the Holocaust. Another reason for silence was very personal reason. In uh, some patriarchal families and some patriarchal communities, women were prevented from speaking up about their gender trauma because they didn't get support from their family members, including their their husbands. Sometimes husband after after learning about what happened to their women, they left them. And it was very difficult. So it was basically the second traumatization for um for those survivors of sexual violence. What we learned from many testimonies in uh, Shaw Foundation, that some women reveal information about uh, sexual victimization decades after, after the war, like 
uh, Rose, who uh, revealed this information to her, uh, to her daughters and to her husband when she was only 53 year old. And she was violated in hiding when she was nine year old. But today's in today's war, uh, a lot changed in past 80 years. And today, due to the recognition of sexual crimes during war as the crimes against humanity, crimes of genocide and the crimes, war crimes, the visibility of sexual violence in Russia's war against Ukraine is huge. And here I put only, you know, several examples from Tallinn, Berlin, Prague and other cities where activists organized this demonstration in order to raise awareness about sexual violence. There are a few documentaries nowadays when those brave women broke the silence and uh, raised their voices about their experience. The support in the Soviet Union, women who suffered sexual violence were not supported. What we observe now in Russia's war against Ukraine, many women could uh, they they have psychological, social, uh, judicial, and other forms of support. Irina Dovhan, she was sexually violated herself in Donetsk back in 2014. And she organized this Zema Ukraine organization. And this organization united those women who survived sexual violence back in 2014, 2015 in Donbas region. As you see, it's a photo from one of their meeting. Women were trying to support each other and are trying to support those new victims uh, and survivors of sexual violence. Many women's organizations in Ukraine are very active agents of change and support for yeah, like uh, your fam, uh, women's perspectives, Genoshi Perspective, La Strada and other and other uh, organizations. I want to acknowledge that Ukrainian government since uh, the, the start of I'm sorry, since the start of full ski invasion developed another approach to investigating uh, sexual violence and uh, joint mobile groups were, um, were established and they consist of prosecutors, investigators uh, and other experts. So basically uh, there is no need for survivors of sexual violence to go to some you know, distance places to report, to spend their own money. Those groups are uh, going to them, to the communities, and they are speaking with uh, those women. Nothing was uh, from, from this was uh, in place back in Soviet, uh, Soviet Ukraine after the Holocaust. Women were not organized in specific groups. They afraid even to talk sometimes uh, uh, with NKVD, for example, and with other organs, because the main question was, how did you survive, actually? Justice. We know that today, um, without justice, we can obtain peace. Without justice, we can develop effective preventive mechanism for dealing with sexual violence. What was uh, the justice, gender justice, for survivors of rape during the Holocaust? Soviet war crimes trials showed no specific or substantial interest in prosecuting of perpetrators of sexual violence. It, uh, it was very common when Holocaust survivors themselves, they were trying to approach NKVD and reveal this information. Why? Because many of those perpetrators lived next door. And some of them were decorated war veterans because they were drafted to the army in 1944 and could return as, you know, veterans, celebrated veterans. And um, many Holocaust survivors, they really um, felt that it's there, it's mandatory for them to seek this justice. So they approached NKVD and they were trying to tell them what happened ba basically to, to Jewish people, what this exact pers person did to Jewish people during the Holocaust. And we know that in many cases, the sexual violence was instrumentalized by Soviet regime because it fits to this image of brutal Nazi soldier and Ukraine collaborator. Because for Soviets, it was very important to reestablish the power there 
uh, the authority in the uh, liberated, so-called liberated territories, Ukraine territories. That's why, for example, they use the testimony of Clara, who was survivor of sexual violence during the Holocaust. And here you see in this print screen, in this photo, you see her on the uh, side of mass killing um, in bar 19. 42, where her community members and family members were killed. At that time, during the shooting, Andrusiv, that I mentioned earlier, the chief of bar police, was instructed by assessment to pick up several, approximately 16 uh, Jewish girls for so-called entertainment. And uh, all of those women, all those young girls were raped and only Clara survived. So she was brave enough to, to give her testimony very publicly, openly. And uh, Soviet authorities organized a show trial in order to punish this, this man, Grigory Andrusi. Why? Because he was connected to uh, Ukraine nationalists in the ground. He was high profile collaborator and he was ideological collaborator. He wasn't opportunistic. And that's why this story of, of Clara was very uh, was very instrumental for uh, local authorities, but sometimes when it comes to to file and train collaborators, for example, like Rabovsky, um, Soviet justice was blind uh, to uh, testimonies of Holocaust survivors. For example, in 1954, Hrabovsky, Jakub Hrabovsky, was sentenced to 10 years in correlational camp for so-called betrayal of the nation. Why? Because he was a guard. Um, uh, he was a policeman, basically, during Nazi occupation of Nova Pavlivka in Odessa Oblast. And he was among those guards who guarded the uh, group of Jews. And among those Jews was Raisa. She was 13 years old. And Hrabovsky was um, a friend of her. Uh, he was at that time 18 years old and he raped her. But during investigation, no one was interested in, in her testimony. And she was blamed for basically what we observed there is a clear sign of victim blaming and the rape culture. She was blamed for not telling uh, the truth to her parents. She was blamed for not approaching Soviet uh, authorities and policemen before, uh, earlier. And um, uh, her behavior was questioned, actually. her She was asked for sexual records and so on. So basically, in many cases, this case is clear example that uh, sexual violence during the Holocaust was instrumentalized by by Soviet regime, and in many cases they were not interested in establishing truths and in in helping survivors of sexual violence. The different, very different situation we have now nowadays in Ukraine. The Office of the Prosecutor General in Ukraine collaborates with so many organizations nowadays, UN, International Criminal Court, Human Rights Watch, and other organizations. The organizations are trying to share their knowledge, to provide some instructions, to provide the support for Ukraine authorities. And um, uh, so far, um, more than uh, so basically 270 cases of sexual violence are under investigation by Office of the Prosecutor General, and you see how many in different places actually they occurred, and among them are against women, men, and uh, and children. So basically, Ukraine government today enjoyed the huge, huge support from different, different uh, agents, different NGO, different organizations. And basically, we already have some rape trials. The first rape trials. That, uh, for example, uh, this trial in Chernihiv region, uh, where um, a Russian soldier. Uh, was blamed for Ruslan Kuliev was blamed for beating 16 year old girl and threatening rape her. He was sentenced to 12 years old in prison. But the problem with these trials, and I believe with future trials in Ukraine, will be that this trial was in absentia. So basically, we don't know where is Rus uh, Ruslan Kuliev now. Maybe he's already killed in the front line. Maybe he's a veteran, celebrated veteran in, in Russia nowadays. But this trial, I believe, has a very symbolic, uh, but 
on the one hand, symbolic meaning, but on the other hand, it has a great meaning for survivors themselves, for their family members, and for community members. I believe that justice should be served, and um, with justice, we can build build a peace and help help women across the world. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marta. That was, uh, it was very powerful and very difficult to hear. Um, there's, uh, I have a couple of questions for you. First of all, uh, in both the cases of World War II and the current uh, Russian war in Ukraine and many other, just about every war, the violence, it's its like male sexual violence, female victims. Um, and uh, in the case of uh, uh, World War II and the Soviet response afterwards, um, a lot of the perpetrators that you talk about are Ukrainians, uh, non uh, Christian Ukrainians. Uh, so I guess uh, I have uh, one question: Is uh, was the church was the did the ha, did the church say anything, or were there uh, instances of church leaders, priests uh, intervening in any way uh, with their uh, flock uh, to try to? Uh, stop some of this or I mean I know the Holocaust was uh people who tried to resist it didn't were also killed but I'm wondering whether uh among you non-Jewish Ukrainians what were the responses mm -hmm. thank you so much so what we know from the Holocaust in Ukraine, um, during the, the wave of pogroms in summer 1941, we have localities where, uh, where church intervened, the local priest actually stopped pogroms or prevented pogroms even. But in some localities, we have priests as instigators of pogroms. We have, so basically, uh, um, sometimes some priests could contribute to the Jewish violence, but in many cases, they were trying to hide, uh, to hide Jews and uh, Jewish people and, and protect them. Um, I don't know the precise cases of, of sexual violence, but thank you so much for this, for this hint. I will look at this. Uh, but what we observe now, church also, in, in Christian discourse, in church discourse, the sexual violence is also present, actually, in, in today's Ukraine. And uh, sometimes it's uh, even problematic. Because some women, as we know, especially young girls, when they are um, impregnated by Russian soldiers, there is a moral dilemma what to do with the so-called product of rape, meaning the, um, the the child. So basically to perform abortion, to keep this child or not. And some priests, they they really believe that uh, they, that, women should preserve those those children they are not allowed this is against the, the law christian law to to make abortion and uh, it's basically contradicts with you know many uh, human rights uh, discourse in ukraine and uh, feminist organizations are trying to to intervene in, in these regards so basically church could play different role a very complex role in in situations of war and especially in terms of uh, sexual violence and gender based violence in general so uh we have a couple of questions um one is how large is the population of jewish women within russia now i don't know if the question is just about russia or russia and ukraine and uh, what was the difference between during before the Holocaust and currently, as I understand it, uh, mm -hmm. the, popul the Jewish population, particularly in Russia, has uh, has diminished considerably. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, so basically, uh, just to to 
to give you um, a picture of Jewish life, uh, of Jewish life before the Holocaust. Ukraine was included in this pale of settlement where Jewish people in 19th century in Russian Empire were uh, resided. So basically, we have a lot of shtetls and Ukraine uh, was, you know, uh, was very important place for Jewish community. Uh, millions of Jews lived in the territory of uh, recent Ukraine and the 1.5 million Jews were killed during the Holocaust in the territories of Ukraine. And in, many of them were killed close to their to their shelters, close to... to uh, their, their homes. Uh, only some part of them were sent to, to Belgium. Nowadays, uh, um, so those who survived basically were those who were drafted to the Red Army or who were evacuated uh, uh, to, to, the, to the East. Nowadays, there are different estimations. Um, at least... Um, uh, at least several uh, thousands of of Ukraine uh, of Jews nowadays are living in Ukraine. But I want to say that after the start of a Russian full ski invasion, many Jews were trying to save their lives, and um, Holocaust survivors, righteous among the nations, and their family members were rescued by uh, governments uh, of Germany, Israel, U.S., Switzerland, and other countries. So basically, nowadays, um, many of them um, are living uh, outside Ukraine. Uh, but still, we uh, today in Ukraine, uh, Jewish community is still is still there, and um, um, Jewish community is trying to uh, to uh, basically uh, to rebuild Jewish life uh, and um, to support Ukraine in this uh, in this war uh, um, in this war against uh, in this war with Russia. Yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, very much under, uh, in the West at least, uh, not emphasized enough that uh, many Jews were killed in the Holocaust by bullets uh, yes. rather than at uh, camps like, the death camps like Auschwitz. Yes. That uh, a large portion of the Jews who survived the Holocaust survived by fleeing East, not West. Yeah, into, yeah. Uh, into uh, Siberia and uh, and Central Asia uh, and other areas of the Soviet Union, and that five hundred thousand, as I understand it, you, you could correct me, uh, Jews served in the Red Army. Uh, yeah, yeah, many Jews so, served in the Red Army. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but then uh, I, I mean, I I just have to say from my personal experience. Uh, after the war in the Soviet period, there was a real effort to deny the specificity of the attacks on Jews and certainly, as you mentioned, sexual violence. And so uh, when I, I actually went to Bobby Yar in 1966 and there was nothing there. Yeah. I mean, it was people yeah. knew they could direct us to uh, the Bobby Yar, but there was no monument. There was nothing, uh, no recognition of what had happened and the monuments or the uh, plaques that were up generally said uh, Soviet citizens were killed yeah, yeah. without a mention of the particular anti-Jewish racist nature of the Nazis. Uh, so uh, again, you know, of course we know the most famous Jewish citizen of Ukraine now is uh, uh, President Zelensky. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, but I get, I guess, a, a kind of another piece of it is how much I, you know, not uh, giving credit credibility to uh, Putin's propaganda, but how much are Ukrainians now that they're in the post-Soviet period coming to terms with Ukrainian collaboration in the Holocaust? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. It's a very difficult question. It's very painful question because uh, after the Maidan, uh, so-called Maidan revolution, uh, ten years ago, um, several memory laws were adopted by Ukraine Parliament in 2015, and according to those laws, all members of Ukraine nationals on the ground basically were proclaimed as um, as those who. Uh, fought for Ukraine independence. So basically, they are celebrated as uh, heroes. Uh, 
as freedom fighters. They are highly celebrated. And those memory laws, they affected the attitude uh, towards the Ukrainian nationalists on the ground in general. Uh, and basically, it prevented many people from discussion um, uh, of these painful and uh, contradictory, you know, pages connected to collaboration with Nazis, um, con uh, connected to uh, um, the Holocaust and ethnic cleansing of, of Poles and uh, so forth. So basically, and war, Russia's aggressions against Ukraine made it worse, actually, because Today's uh, different state actors, memory agents, memory uh, actors, they are trying to make this clear, uh, this clear reference between uh, Ukrainian nationals on the ground and current uh, freedom fighters, those who are fighting with Russia. Basically, the nar narrative is the, uh, the enemy is the same. And back then, those who fought and sacrifice their life where members of Ukraine nationals on the ground. And now we have Ukraine uh, armed forces and, and so forth. And basically because of that, uh, it's very difficult to discuss um, to discuss these contradictory issues. And those people who are trying to, to raise those issues are blamed for facilitating Russia propaganda, for being enemies of the people and i myself uh, often hear uh, those those blames those accusations that i am not true ukraine i am not true patriot because i am concentrating on bad things instead of concentrating on on you know um, uh, um, some pot positive you know things about ukraine nations on the ground that's why it's still very very difficult story and i believe that war contributes to to the silence and contributes to to this um, to the concealing of of this uh, very traumatic uh, past. So, uh, another question: um, Are there any organized research and documentation projects specifically focused on sexual violence in Ukraine now, separate from collection of legal testimony? And I would think you would be a big expert on that. <laughs> To my understanding, I don't know about some research projects. I'm not aware about this. Uh, but uh, of course, many, many actors, I mean NGOs, are collecting those evidence and um, they are trying to, to find um, testimonies, those people who are willing to testify. But, but of course, it's very, it's very difficult due to different reasons, you know, fear of stigmatization, shame, but also some people are really afraid that uh, Russians will come and they will punish those people who reveal this information. Another reason is we still have a presence of victim blaming culture, rape culture, and some of those women who reveal this information were blamed by their community members, by their neighbors for entertaining uh, Russian soldiers, basically for uh, sexual collaboration. That's why, and some of them even um, fl fled their communities because they, they can suffer this constant, uh, constant uh, re-traumatization and those, uh, those accusations. That's why it's very, it's very difficult to, to establish how many women were killed and still 25% of Ukraine territory is still occupied by Russians. And, you know, uh, we, we don't have access to, to those people and we don't, uh, we, we can't establish truths and we can establish uh, numbers of, of those women. Very important to, of course, to talk with my research. I, I made the research with um, survivors of sexual violence uh, from back um, World War II and from with survivors of, of this current war. But um, it's very difficult, as you know. You should be well prepared. You should be well trained. And it's very sensitive issue. So uh, it's very responsible. So basically, I was recently uh, contacted by one, uh, one uh, student who wanted to to make some research and talk to those women via uh, internet. And, you know, it, it, I believe it's it's not possible to do that. I never spoke to women about such an experience via internet. 
you should be present, you should be with them in the one space because of, of the nature of the sexual ones. And I believe that gender here plays a huge role. Women are more open to women in conversation with women, especially when women researchers has a feminist uh, feminist perspective, and they are well, very uh, well trained and um, very knowledgeable um, researchers. Yeah, I noticed that many of the much of the testimony that you presented about World War II and the Holocaust came from testimonies with the through the Shoah Foundation, which yes. is a relatively recent. Uh, I think it's Steven Spielberg's. Yes. So it really was established after Schindler's List, which is uh, relatively recent. Uh, so I'm wondering, I guess, again, along the lines of what was asked, whether uh, there are foundations that are uh, in the process of being uh, organized or uh, if that's a thought for the future in terms of the current war. Uh, Yes, thank you so much. Uh, there are several uh, oral history projects nowadays, and uh, uh, they are trying to to talk to survivors of Russian occupation about different kinds of experiences, including gender based violence. One of those projects is led by uh, by my colleague from Poland, uh, Anya Wilegawa, and the Center of Urban History is engaged also in this project, and they are um, doing a very um, uh, great job. And to my understanding, there are other initiatives who are trying to collect those testimonies, not precisely about sexual ones, but about uh, war experience in, in general. And uh, I, I really believe it's a very valuable initiative because preserving uh, testimonies preserving uh, those memories is very, very is crucial, basically, for not only for uh, researchers but for uh, for communities in general. And it was very huge ethical dilemma because uh, even inside Ukraine, Ukraine academic community, it was the discussion: is it ethical to approach those women who? suffer such a tremendous loss who are suffer such level of insecurity because they many of them were displaced many of them lost their houses their homes their cities are under russian occupation they have nothing basically they are really traumatized they they um under such a financial burden uh pressure and so on and so forth but many, uh, but as a result of this, you know, very hot discussion inside Ukraine academia, it was basically a consensus that um, we uh, we can approach uh, those women, and uh, um, they because what I I um, encounter, I talk to women uh, from Mariupol. And many of them were willing to share their stories and the stories of sexual victimization of other women. And they were, they considered there uh, this as some sort of relief for them. It was very important to, to, to disseminate this information, to to make those uh, this information known to the public, uh, because uh, there is always a fear that nobody uh, will be brought to justice, nobody will be punished for their deeds. And some women, of course, are not ready to talk about their experience. So uh, with all respect, we should give them a time and uh, be um, patient and be uh, very, very polite. Uh, yes. And to avoid some sensitive, you know, questions, for example. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, it's very interesting that the male perpetrators are not stigmatized in the way that the Female, uh, female victims of rape are stigmatized. And uh, along those lines, there is a question here about why do Russians rape Ukrainian children and old women? And I wanted to ask that in the context of kind of overall policy, uh, military policy, it seems pretty clear in World War II that uh, the dehumanization of Jewish uh, Jews in general and Jewish women kind of gave uh, a free a green light for uh, Nazis and their collaborators to feel that the, that women were fair game. And it, yeah. certainly we know the history of the Red Army in Germany after World War, or 
at the end of World War II, which in which it certainly seems like if it was an official policy, soldiers were given the green light to rape women in Germany uh, yeah. without any consequences. And so I'm wondering now whether there's any evidence of official uh, Russian army policy around sexual violence. Is it encouraged? Uh, we know, uh, by the way, I just want to uh, mention the film Bucha, which I just saw, which is an excellent film. Uh, it's a dramatization of uh, the uh, red, the Russian army occupation of uh, the areas around Kiev, Bucha being a suburb of Kiev. But um, it does seem like uh, rape, if not tolerated, is even encouraged as part of uh, military policy. So I'm wondering if you have evidence of that or, mm -hmm. and it Thank seems like it doesn't matter whether it's kids or old, I mean, anybody, any Ukrainian, again, is dehumanized any women and men and are uh, fair game. Yeah, thank you so much. First of all, I want to to give some historical context. In case of uh, uh, Russian army, Russian army has a great record, historical record of participating in sexual violence. As you mentioned, Red Army, uh, of course, Red Army was composed uh, of different uh, soldiers, including Ukraine soldiers, but no one basically was uh, uh, put on trial for sexual victimization of uh, German women in spring 19, uh, 1945, you know, for victimization of Hungarian women. Then um, those who returned from uh, from Germany in 1945, were engaged in uh, counterinsurgency in Western Ukraine, actually in fighting with Ukraine nationalists on the ground, and the sexual violence was tolerated as well. Why? Because after the end of the Second World War, it was the main problem for Soviets, Ukraine nationalists on the ground, and it was very well organized. It was very made massive. That's why from 44 to 53. Almost half a million people were repressed. Among them, more than 100,000 were killed. That's why, for, for, uh, so basically, um, Ukrainian nationalists were the main threat for Soviet authority, for Soviet power. That's why they tolerated sexual violence as a means of the uh, as a means of this um, of this fight. Then we have, you know, Chechnya. Then we have Georgia. Then we have Syria. And no one was put on trial as well. So basically, it's a, a so-called infamous tradition in the Russian military that uh, perpetrators are not uh, are not punished. Is the one reason what we observe in political discourse in Russia? Complete denial of what happened, of what Russian soldiers are doing. Spokesperson of Putin, um, Peskov. Right at the beginning, after liberation of Bucha, when the first, you know, accounts of sexual violence were revealed, leaked to the media, he said, it's not true. It's um, counter-propaganda, Western propaganda, like it was propaganda, West propaganda against Red Army soldiers. They were innocent back then, and we are innocent, said the chief propagandist Solovyov. Constantly, Russian officials are denying the involvement of their soldiers, but they disseminate the information about sexual violence against Russian, uh, against Ukraine, uh, Ukraine people through even state-controlled social media. For example, one of the video when Ukrainian soldier was castrated by a Russian soldier and then killed was disseminated through state-controlled Russian media. Why? Because it was uh, the message to Ukrainian soldiers, surrender or you will suffer the same fate. It was the, the instrument of uh, demoralization. So Russian authorities are very well aware of wrongdoings of their soldiers. But for them, what is most important to achieve their military and political goals. That's why from testimonies of uh, survivors, we know that sexual violence is tolerated in many cases, is orchestrated by commanders themselves. And in many cases, it's not prevented, even from the phone calls uh, from Russian soldiers to their family members. 
those intercepted by uh, security service of Ukraine. We see that some, you know, wives, they encourage their husband to rape Ukrainian women just to protect themselves. We see how Russian soldiers discussed what happened to Ukrainian women, and they are, some of them, they are shocked that their commanders didn't punish perpetrators. When the punishment is absent, it could be, it could, it basically serve as an encouragement of soldiers. So why, uh, I don't believe in orders to rape, but I believe that uh, many Russian commanders turn the blind eyes um, be because they want to achieve their military goals in Ukraine. And they want to demoralize Ukraine population. They want to subjugate them, uh, terrorize them, and so on and so forth. That's why they tolerate this violence, this sort of violence, because sexual violence is a very effective weapon of war. Very, very effective, but very cheap in comparison to drones, rockets, and bombs. And I, I think we should also mention that there is, as you noted, sexual violence towards men as well as women. I, although the majority of the victims are women, there's also uh, what you mentioned, the castration and other forms of sexual violence towards men. I also wanted to ask you, and may, I don't know if you know about this so much, but it seems like part of uh, the uh, discussion about sexual violence in Russia by the troops is racist. That is that the uh, many of the we know that many of the Russian troops are from non-Slavic, the regional uh, ethnic minorities within Russia, the Chechens, the Buryats, uh, the Bashkirs, uh, the Tuvans, and um, is uh, as I've seen it often, uh, the sexual violence is blamed on these ethnic minorities, uh, and I noticed one of the pictures that you had of. Russian soldiers seemed like they were uh, uh, from the ethnic minorities. Um, so yes, wondering, thank you. So, yeah. I'm, I'm wondering about that, not only the dialogue in Russia, but also the dialogue in Ukraine. Yes, I noticed the same, actually. When I spoke to those uh, women from Mariupol, for example, they uh, developed uh, their own hierarchical perpetrators. And they said to me, at first... Our boys from Eleanor Denner came, and it was okay in Mariupol. Then Russian soldiers came, and we started to hide our daughters. But then Chechen came, and rape started. So basically, in these internal internal discussions among survivors and witnesses of sexual violence, we also see uh, these patterns, this um, racial discourse about the perpetrators. And in many cases, for example, what I noticed, um, we uh, have several cases of sexual violence against men, civilian men, especially homosexual men. And in those cases, Chechen soldiers are also, uh, uh, also participating. I believe that Chechen soldiers are portrayed as, um, you know, very violent and cruel and very brutal. Um, due to um, the general uh, political situation in Germany as well. Uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> in Russia as well. Because as we know, for example, in Chechnya, um, some homosexual people experience killing and beating and very brutal treatment in hands of, of local authorities, which, of course, in, in, um, in hands of Kadyrov. But at the same time, on Ukraine side, we have Chechen people so basically, they are on different sides uh, on of the front, actually. But yes, there are numerous cases when uh, of rape and sexual violence, other forms of sexual violence, where non-Slavic uh, people in Russian army are um, are participating, are perpetrators. We'll see. It, it depends on on the the. Um, cases that will be investigated, uh, revealed, and so on. Those who are uh, uh, already charged with sexual violence, among them are many Slavic people. Um, yeah, so we'll see. So uh, we we don't have, we're kind of at the end of, of our time. 
Um, I had, uh, do you have examples of women resisting and fighting back uh, and taking justice into their own hands? I mean, there have been examples of women uh, lacing vodka with poison, uh, enticing men, uh, Russian soldiers to what they think is a rendezvous only to be blown up or whatever. I mean, are there, do you have examples of that? I know that there were some cases after World War II where yeah. uh, uh, Jewish groups uh, took yeah. matters into their own hands. Uh, uh, yes, uh, thank you so much. So what I notice, um, many women are trying to develop survival strategies. For example, they share some instructions how to behave in order to avoid rape. And it's very similar to to those patterns of behavior of women during that I observed during the Second World War. For example, to make your face unattractive, to cut your hair off in order to be um, not attractive, actually, not to attract attention of of perpetrators, to to make some hiding places to avoid contacts with them, not to be polite and so on. But there are also uh, cases where women are trying to, to approach high level Russian commanders and report rape, actually. In some cases, commanders said to women, okay, we will we'll punish perpetrators. Uh, in, in one case, in, in one case in Kiev region, woman uh, was raped, and he approached Russian commander, and he said, "Do you want me to shot him, to kill him?" And she said, "Yeah, I want you to to kill him, basically." But he was just, you know, slap him on on his face. In another case, when this sixteen year old woman, pregnant woman, was raped. She and her mother also approached Russian a Russian commander, and they asked him to punish, uh, to punish this this guy. And he said, uh, "We killed him." But they believe that you know this this soldier was uh, transferred to another to another uh, location. So basically, women are trying to take um, to take actions, and in many cases. Not men are interfered interfered in that. Not men. Men are trying. I'm sorry. Men are trying to 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 fight at the beginning to prevent rape, actually. But then, women are trying to seek justice. Women are try uh, are seeking some revenge. And I um I hear the story when some men. They suffered this trauma that you know that they uh, that they didn't prevent rape. They are not you know masculine enough, so they prevent their women from speaking up and seeking justice because they feel humiliated and they don't want to reveal information this information to to the neighbors. So they prevent their women from from taking actions. It's not uh, rare, but yes, women. And to my understanding. Even using your body as a survival tool, it's an act of resistance because you survive and your beloved ones could survive due to your sacrifice. And we know that in occupied territories, uh, uh, infrastructure is destroyed, the lack of food, the lack of medicine. That's why some women, I believe, will and are already engaged in some uh, sexual barter and uh, survival sex. To my understanding, it could be considered as a form of resistance, but it's a uh, you know uh, it's very challenging, and I believe that some neighbors will you know report on those those women, and you know it uh, it will some women could could face even punishment for so called collaboration. So it's still very very sensitive, very complex issue, like it was after the Second World War, after the Holocaust, when some women who survived were asked, how did you survive, actually? Yes, and what did you do? You fraternized with this Nazi bastard or this, you know, local Ukrainian bastard? So many, many questions and many dilemmas uh, in, in the post-war society we will experience. So we are now are almost to the end of our time, and I'm wondering if you want to uh, say some final words and also recommend maybe some resources for people who want to uh, do further uh, re research about this topic, or uh, I certainly, I recommend the film Bucha, which uh, mm -hmm. I'm hoping will get much wider distribution uh, 
but if you want to yes. recommend some resources or mm -hmm. uh, charities to uh, to which to donate or yes thank you so much uh rochelle so, so i recommend film as well some some documentaries like 20 days in mariupol uh it's a very powerful documentary film about um basically um you know uh, when the russians started this war um they uh, said that they came to liberate people and protect russian speaking people but among those who suffered the most so far are Russian-speaking people, especially people in Mariupol. And uh, um, uh, 20 Days in Mariupol is a powerful film about those those sufferings of local people in hand, in hands of brothers' nation. Also, I recommend recently was published Intercepted, a uh, film uh, about those um, intercepted conversation among Russian soldiers when they discuss what they are doing in Ukraine with their family members. And we can see the level of indifference or encouragement from ordinary Russian people. So basically, we can um, uh, uh, we can understand the, the nature of violence and the motivation of perpetrators, or at least we'll try to understand. Also, I encourage you to donate to human rights organization and, first of all, women's rights organization like La Strada, Your Femme, Ginochi Perspective. They are trying to help women. Uh, if you are ready to help military women, I encourage you to help Ukraine's veterans movement. They did a great job in Ukraine since 2014. They they uh, uh, they organized a huge campaign, advocative campaign, and they made so many changes in Ukraine law and in Ukraine perception in society, perception of military women. They put pressure on government and government open combat position for women, and many of them could basically uh, nowadays consider army um, as a as a place of uh, of their emancipation. And they are helping still Ukraine soldiers, as you know, female soldiers, as you know, probably that 63,000 of Ukraine women are currently in uh, in Ukraine armed forces and 5,000 of them are in the hard um, um, spots in the front lines, in the battlefields. And they experienced many challenges uh, and, and many uh, many troubles. So I encourage you to support those women uh, as well and not to turn a blind eyes to what is going on in Ukraine, especially in terms of sexual violence, because it's not only a question of Ukraine people or Russian people. It's a question of human rights. It's a question of women's rights. Uh, it's a question of, of uh, justice. Thank you very much. As you uh, I suggest that all of you look at the chat where we've posted uh, links to what Marta has mentioned. And then uh, I personally, and I'm sure Marta would agree with this, urge you to lobby your congresspeople so that aid to yeah. Ukraine can be passed and no longer blocked. Yeah. So thank you again, Marta, for this wonderful talk on a very, very difficult subject. Uh, you've really enlightened us a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rochelle. Thank you so much for all of you who made this time for this very important conversation. So be safe, be well, and yeah, fight for justice and for human rights. Thank you.